It turns out that while all the hype lately has been about OpenAI's ChatGPT-01, Google has quietly released a product that is just as impressive and I think might be even more useful, and I will show you how to use it. So let's take a look. Hey y'all, it's Dr. Know-It-All. I'm going to talk about Google's new Notebook LM that has been out there for private party testing, but is now available in an experimental package. Regardless of the claim that it's experimental, it seems to work pretty darn well at this point. And a big shout out to Bill French, who is a friend and colleague for turning me on to this because I'm like, this is pretty darn amazing. He showed me the podcast feature of Notebook LM and I was like, how in the world did you do this? And he was like, it took like two minutes. And so I basically went and figured it out myself. It took about two minutes and I was like, wow, this is really darn impressive. So we'll get there in a second, but first I want to weigh in quickly on the OpenAI ChatGPT-01 sort of controversy. There were folks, in particular Dave Shapiro, I noticed, who initially took a rather unimpressed stance to ChatGPT-01, and his and others' main rationale was, look, I could do this myself with prompt engineering. But this morning while I was at the gym, I listened to a podcast from Dave, and he, you know, said, look, it's more impressive than I at first thought, and I personally agree in my testing, it was really, really good. I think that while 01 is an incremental incremental improvement, it's an incremental gain over ChatGPT4. The important part is the kind of architecture that they're building and the fact that they got so much improvement with an old model. Now, we don't know this for sure, but the suspicion is that this is basically just ChatGPT4 with the new sort of Q-star strawberry type of training. And the really big advances are going to happen around Christmas time. Sam Altman has recently sort of teased that around Christmas time or potentially on Christmas Day, we're going to get a Christmas present. That will be Orion, which will be the next generation large language model that will be trained on synthetic data created by O1. And then we will see the major step change. At any rate, we're rapidly moving towards what I think is AGI. I think it's going to be very difficult to argue against artificial general intelligence, not agentic intelligence, but just generally intelligent, good reasoning capability models. And we're heading there really fast. And with that, I'm going to segue to Notebook LM, which again, didn't get a lot of hype, but I think it's super important. And I really believe believe it's going to be very, very useful to you as well. So that's why I want to show you how to use it. And in particular, I think you might find the new podcast feature to be a really, really useful feature. It's very, very cool, very impressive, and actually is a nice way of boiling down some complex stuff into a very entertaining and easy to understand format. And it's really convincing that it is actually a podcast. So Notebook LM has been around in sort of private testing for a while, but there's a bunch of new features and it's available for everyone to use at this point. Basically, you just, you know, use your Google account, which I assume everybody has at this point, and you point it at notebooklm.google.com. I think just notebooklm.com will work as well. You can see what you can get is different notebooks and everything. And let's just go ahead and create a new notebook. And you can see that you can add sources to this notebook. And so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to hop over here and let's just take something really complex, like um, this recent archive article, Black Holes, Complex Curve, and Graph Theory, Revising a Conjecture by a Kasner. So yeah, that sounds pretty interesting. So note here, this is the 12th of September. So this is way outside the domain of any kind of large language model training. And I can just copy the URL for the PDF file and paste it over here where it says website. I will just put in a link to the URL and then I right over my, where my face is, there we go. So it reads the article and then you get access to a bunch of different possibilities with this article. More on that in a minute, but first, I loved eating cereal when I was a child. But as I grew up, I realized I couldn't enjoy cereal for breakfast or snacks guilt-free anymore. Well, today's sponsor, Magic Spoon, has great news for your inner child. Why not have that great taste, but in a no-sugar, no-gluten, low-carb cereal so you can enjoy it guilt-free? Magic Spoon has great flavors like cocoa, peanut butter, frosted, and my new favorite, maple waffle, with the amazing taste of maple syrup on waffles. And look, they have totally fun boxes too to help bring back that childhood Saturday morning feeling. And each serving only has four grams of net carbs, so it's keto friendly, zero grams of sugar, which is great for my low sugar diet, and 14 grams of protein, which is more than two eggs worth of protein. And the best part is that all the flavors are totally delicious. Not only do I and my wife misinformation love it, but even our picky eater teenage son loves Magic Spoon. So we have a new cereal the whole family can enjoy. Check out the link below to grab a variety pack and try it today 
today. And be sure to use the promo code Dr. Know It All at checkout to get $5 off any order. Or go to magicspoon.com slash Dr. Know It All. And Magic Spoon is so confident in their product, it's backed with a 100% happiness guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason, they'll refund your money, no questions asked. So click the link below or scan the QR code on the screen and use the code Dr. Know It All for $5 off or go to Magic Spoon slash Dr. Know It All to save $5 today. A big thanks to Magic Spoon for sponsoring this video, and now let's get back to it. So if we head over to archive.org and look at recent machine learning papers, you can see one from September 12th, which is well past, you know, the training time of any Google model. You can see one called click to mask local editing with dynamic mask generalization. I can then click on the URL and I can copy it and then paste it into the notebook LM. And then after a couple of seconds or a couple of minutes, depending on how long it takes, and uh, Google's been a little bit tweaky this morning, so I'm actually using one that I've already inserted because if I tried to look at this black hole one, unfortunately, it's just sitting there and spinning. So <laughs> it figures when I want to do a demo, it's not going to work. And again, it is still experimental. But anyway, it will read in the article and then not only allow you to, you know, sort of interview that article, but even have suggested questions. The limitations of existing methods for local image editing, explain how the dynamic mask evolution process and click to me contributes to the generation of contextually relative relevant edits and so we can go ahead and click that one and it will generate a response based on what we have asked it and so you can see here that it actually has an explanation of this initial mask iterative contraction semantic guidance potential height field etc cetera, etc cetera. so you can you can accept this give it a thumbs up whatever you can copy it if you want to or you can actually save it to a note and this now becomes a note that's actually saved into this particular notebook and of course i can ask it specific questions as well so in this particular case i just asked why is diffusion-based masking useful and i will see what it generates as an answer and so according to the article, the advantages are contextually aware, that makes sense, dynamic and iterative, that also makes sense, able to handle complex edits, etc. user-friendly. Notice that we also have citations here, and if you click on those citations, it will actually show you where in the source you know, document it is. So this is really, really useful. But the crazy new feature that's available, and unfortunately, it only seems to be available when you first create the notebook. So fortunately, the black hole thing finally decided to read itself in. But there's an audio overview deep dive conversation to hosts English only. So it's at this point just a podcast between a male voice and a female voice. But it does a fantastic job. And according to Google, they'll expand this over time. But right now, you just click generate, and it generates a conversation of somewhere between five and 10 minutes, it looks like, between these two characters and they talk about whatever it is you gave them. And notice that you can have multiple sources. You could, you know, add not just this source, which is about black holes, but you could have other sources that were talking about black holes, other recent articles, and they would do a podcast based on all of those sources, not just one. It does take a couple of minutes to generate this, but then you can go ahead and download it. And so while that's downloading, you can see here that this is the one for the click to me archive paper and I downloaded it and it's uh, seven minutes and six seconds. I will paste this at the end in its entirety, but I'm just going to give you a feel for it right now. Ever scrolled past a photo and thought, you know what this needs? A rubber ducky mm -hmm. right there. And not just like a tiny one off in the corner, but like a huge E one, like stealing the show, trying to actually do that with like most editing tools. Nightmare. We'll get ready for some magic because today's deep dive is all about a paper that makes that rubber ducky dream shockingly real. It's called Click to Mask, Local Editing with Dynamic Mask Generation. And uh, these researchers from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem are about to rock your world. Okay, so before we get to the cool stuff, we've got to talk about the problem. Because you, dear listener, probably know how frustrating AI image editing can be sometimes. Frustrating is an understatement. I mean, yeah. some of these tools you're stuck like meticulously painting over every single pixel you want to change. So there you can hear in the first 50 seconds, you can hear there's a male voice, a female voice. They It reads the article and turns it into a very believable podcast. You can also see that this has been going for a while. It does take a couple of minutes to generate this conversation, but the cool part is you can do this with basically anything. So what I did was I took a transcript of a YouTube video of Elon Musk talking at the X takeover that I had videoed. It's about an hour long conversation and I wanted to see how Notebook LM's podcast feature would work with it. So here's the original video just for a quick reference. It's an hour and two minutes and 57 seconds as you can see. We would like to catch the mecha, the, the booster in the giant mechazilla arms which is, sounds kind of insane um, and uh, because this is the, the, this is the largest flying object ever made so to catch it with uh, you know giant robot arms 
is um, you know pluck it out of the sky is is pretty insane. But uh, I think it's it's got a decent chance of working. Uh, might take a, take a few kicks at the can before it's actually <laughs> before it works well. So there you can see what we originally had. Now let's take a listen to the podcast version. All right, everyone, get ready to dive deep because today we're jumping headfirst into the mind of Elon Musk. We're breaking down his interview at the recent X Takeover event. And let me tell you, this one was a wild ride. He was supposed to talk for like five minutes, but Elon being Elon, almost an hour later, and he was still going strong. We're talking SpaceX, Tesla, the future of humanity, really, you name it. It's a lot to unpack, that's for sure. Definitely. So let's just jump right in. Yeah, yeah let's do it. Perfect. Let's start with SpaceX. So there you can hear it's just been recast into a 10 minute and 30 second podcast. You have the two voices that go back and forth, very friendly. It's really funny. Once in a while, they will actually have commercial breaks that will pop up. So they'll be like, we'll be right back after our commercial break. Very amusing because they trained on podcasts, clearly. So in podcasts always have those commercial breaks where they have their sponsors and everything, speaking of. And of course, I will also attach this at the end as well. So you can listen to both of these podcasts and you can determine what you think overall. But again, super super, super easy to do this. It just takes a couple of minutes and a couple of clicks. And of course, if a podcast is not your style, you can always just directly interact with the transcript in the notebook by clicking on that. And let's see, the potential impact of full self-driving technology and the future of transportation, according to Elon Musk. Yeah, let's go ahead and ask that question of the transcript. So you can see here that you can take notes. You can actually insert your own notes about all of these things. And of course, you can either save or discard these notes. But you can see from cars to mobile lounges, revolutionizing asset utilization exponential value growth for Tesla so those are the you know the sort of headline things and if I like this I can save it to a note and then I have a note and notice that we also have uh, follow-up questions so not only is it giving you these notes but it's also giving you like follow-up ideas and of course if I want to add a note myself I can just add one here and I can type whatever the heck I want to so you can see I can type some sort of a note and I can actually you know boldface it if I want to so you can format the note and everything so just like a notebook except that you actually have access to the sources. And again, I could take like all of Elon's recent interviews and I could make all of those sources. And so I could query not just this one video, but like everything that Elon's talked about recently to find out what he thinks about particularly full self-driving, neural networks, whatever you want. All right, it took a little while, but here you can see we have the Black Hole Archive article, which has been turned into a podcast. I can click on the right to download it. So it will actually download. And let's just give a sample try of this. All right. Buckle up, because today we're going deep on something pretty wild, something you've probably never even heard of. We're talking about Komar Charge. Komar Charge, right. It's like this, well, it's almost like a secret code. You could say that, yeah. And physicists are using it to unlock, like, some really mind-blowing stuff about black holes. Yeah, black holes are some of the most mysterious objects in the universe. Soul no mysteries, right. In Komar Targe. All right, so I'll pause that there, and I actually want to listen to the rest of it, so I'm going to go ahead and paste that at the end of this video as well. So you will have a lot to listen to in these terms of these podcasts. If you want to sort of skip around, I'll put a different picture for each one so it's easy to tell which one you're listening to. But overall, it takes just a couple of clicks and a couple of minutes to take any of these sources and turn it into a podcast. That that is pretty darn remarkable. And I have to say, I'm really impressed with what Google is doing with their Notebook LM and really how practical this is going to be. I really think that this is going to be a very practical tool that a lot of people are going to want to use. So like I said in the intro, ChatGPT01 has kind of sucked all the attention out of the room at this point. But I actually find this Notebook LM incredibly useful as a practical tool. You can add as many sources to a notebook as you want. It has to be text at this point. Apparently, in the future, audio and video will be available as input sources, but not yet. You can then create notes yourself. You can query the AI and you can even generate a podcast of the sources and you can have these male and female voices talking to each other. Again, eventually this is going to become something where you might be able to have solo ones and maybe you can have a voice of your own. Hint, hint. I mean, we could be looking very, very soon at me being able to clone my own voice like with Eleven Labs put in a couple of transcripts or a couple of papers and have me talk about those papers without even having to be there. That's kind of a bizarre thought and a little bit worrisome for me as well as a content creator, but that's the kind of future we're looking at. And one final note about this is Bill actually mentioned that not only public facing podcasts, but inward facing podcasts could be super useful. Imagine if there was like a two hour company meeting that you had to miss for some reason, and you could just take the transcript of that, pump it into Notebook LM, 
them and produce like a seven or eight minute podcast that will give you all the most salient information from that meeting in a kind of entertaining format that you can listen to on your drive home and get the gist of the two hour meeting without having to read it. And if you have any follow up questions, of course, you can just ask the source material in the notebook itself. You can save the notes for future reference. This is a really, really powerful tool. I don't think at this point you can share notebooks between teams, but remember, this is a very early release of this. So this is like the worst it's going to be. And I already have found it to be a very, very practical and useful tool. All right, so that's what I've got for you. Let me know what you think about Notebook LM. Have you used it yet? If not, I hope you do give it a try because it is quite useful, I think. Let me know in the comments what you think about all of this and how you have used Notebook LM or how you plan to use Notebook LM. And while you're down there, if you don't mind liking and subscribing, it super helps out the channel. Thank you so much. And finally, a big thanks to Magic Spoon for sponsoring today's video. Be sure to click the link or scan the QR code to get $5 off your order, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye. All right, everyone, get ready to dive deep because today we're jumping headfirst into the mind of Elon Musk. We're breaking down his interview at the recent X Takeover event. And let me tell you, this one's a wild ride. He was supposed to talk for like five minutes, but Elon being Elon, almost an hour later, and he was still going strong. We're talking SpaceX, Tesla, the future of humanity, really, you name it. It's a lot to unpack, that's for sure. Definitely. So let's just jump right in. Yeah, yeah let's do it. Perfect. Let's start with SpaceX and that crazy ambitious Starship program. I mean, we're talking about the world's first fully reusable orbital rocket, which is insane enough on its own. But of course, Elon had to take it like 10 steps further. Well, you know, you can't talk about Starship without talking about the size of this thing. Elon actually called it the largest flying object ever made. He's not wrong. No, he's not. And it needs to be that big because he's got some big goals. And reusability is kind of the key, right? It is. It's like the holy grail of space travel. And Elon's been saying this forever. Why, though? Why is reusability so important? Because it's all about cost. It could make space flight like 100 times cheaper. Get out. Yeah. That's not an exaggeration. We're talking about a complete game changer here. Wow. That completely changes the game if we can get those costs down. It really does. And that kind of cost reduction, it's essential for what Elon really wants, making humanity multiplanetary. He's not just talking about visiting Mars for like a weekend trip, is he? No. He's talking about building a whole civilization on ours. OK, so we've got this massive reusable rocket. How do you even begin to land something like that? Like, how do you even start to think about it? Right. That sounds impossible. It does. Well, Elon's solution, you ready for this? Hit me. He wants to catch the booster. Catch it. With giant robot arms as it comes back down to Earth. <laughs> okay, come on. It's straight out of Star Wars. I know, right? E even Elon admitted that it's, and I quote, got a decent chance but also might take a few kicks at the can to get right. A few kicks at the can. That's our Elon. Classic. But in all seriousness, they're not shying away from a challenge, are they? It, especially when we think back to that test flight where the landing was, sh shall we say, a little crispy. Crispy might be putting it lightly. Honestly, it's a miracle we have video footage of that thing. I mean, they lost a bunch of heat shield tiles coming back down to Earth. Yeah. A bunch is one way to put it. Elon actually said the flaps were like skeleton hands after all that heat. Yeah, can you imagine? Well, Talk about a wild ride. But that's SpaceX, right? Totally. Always iterating, always improving. They don't just sit around and rest on their laurels after a, you know, somewhat successful test flight. Oh, no, not at all. And they've already made huge improvements. They have. Even since then, the heat shield for the next launch is going to be so much better. Oh, yeah. Elon said it's at least twice as good infinitely better than the last one. Okay, infinitely better is a good sign. Yeah. How do they even improve it, though? Well, for one, they've added a whole secondary heat shield. Smart. Just in case, you know. Double the protection. You can never be too careful when you're talking about, you know, giant rockets flying through space. That's Elon's motto, I think. Safety first. Uh, maybe second or third after make it awesome and push the boundaries of what's possible. Yeah, that sounds more accurate. I but in all seriousness, it sounds like they're taking safety very seriously this time around. Oh, they are. They said they're aiming for at least three successful landings before they even try to bring it back to the launch site. So they're going to land it a bunch of times, 
before they even try to land it back where it started. Exactly. That's pretty cautious for them, isn't it? It is, but it makes sense. Totally. You don't want to rush these things. Especially with something as powerful as Starship. Definitely not. Though it wouldn't be a SpaceX project without some, let's call them design adjustments along the way. I think. I mean, even Elon admitted those forward flaps were a design mistake. Yeah, that was pretty funny to hear him say that. Right. He really just tells it like it is. He does. But yeah, what was wrong with the flaps? They were causing some control issues during landing. I see. They were just too big, apparently. Really? Yeah, and too symmetrical. Hmm. Sure. All things. Classic Elon. Even with engineering, it's all about constant iteration, always improving. Yep, that's the SpaceX way. And you know what? That actually ties in perfectly with our next topic, Tesla. Oh, how so? Because Elon really wants people to understand that Tesla isn't just a car company anymore. He's been saying that for a while now. He has. But he really emphasized it in this interview. What did he say exactly? He said Tesla is an AI and robotics company. Hmm. Interesting. Right. It's about more than just building cars. So what are they building? They're building the future. Okay. It's the future of AI, robotics, all of that coming together. Exactly. And what better way to showcase that than with their Optimus humanoid robot? So you get me. That's exactly what I'm talking about. It's like the perfect embodiment of what Tesla's all about. It's like they're building this whole interconnected world of intelligent machines. Did you know Elon actually said that both Tesla cars and Optimus are basically intelligent robots at their core? He's right. I mean, when you really think about it. It's pretty wild to think about. It is. But that's Elon for you. That's our Elon. So walk me through this Optimus thing a little bit, would you? Sure. Basically, Optimus is being developed in a very Tesla way, Ooh. meaning they couldn't just buy a bunch of parts and put it together. Oh, really? Nope. Nothing on the market was good enough for them. They had to design and build everything from scratch. Whoa, seriously. Seriously, every single component. Man, can you imagine having to reinvent the wheel like that? Talk about a challenge. That's got to be such a pain. Yeah, well, Elon got into some of the nitty-gritty engineering challenges, which yeah. I have to admit, I geeked out on a little. Oh, yeah. I'm like, why? For example, designing actuators that are able to like actually mimic the movement of the human body. Oh, wow. It's way more complicated than you might think. I believe it. Elon said it's like puppet strings in your forearm. <laughs> Seriously. Yeah. That's how complex these things are. That's insane. And we just kind of take it for granted how easily our bodies just move. I know, right? It really makes you appreciate the elegance of the human body, you know? Absolutely. But anyway, back to Optimus. Oh, yeah. I almost forgot where we were. Where were we? We were talking about how Optimus is more than just fancy hardware. It's about the brain get this what what is it optimus is going to be running on the same ai brain as the tesla cars hold on are you serious i'm serious you mean to tell me that optimus is going to be learning and adapting like all the teslas out there on the roads right now you got it no way it's like they're taking all of that real world driving data and they're putting it right into this humanoid robot okay see now this is where i got to stop you because remember when we were listening to that interview the other day yeah and Elon was talking about Optimus being in everyone's homes. Yeah, like it's no big deal. Like an iPhone or something. Right. He actually compared it to having your own R2-D2 or C-3PO. It's straight out of Star Wars. But his logic, like, actually kind of makes sense if you think about it. Totally. Imagine if you had a robot that could, like, do all those little things that take up your time. I know. It could do the dishes, fold the laundry, mow the lawn. You name it. Exactly. Think about how much time we'd all save. And think about, like... Elderly people who need a little extra help around the house or people with disabilities. Right. This could be a game changer for so many people. It could be revolutionary. Totally. Okay, so how much is this going to cost me? Well, Elon thinks it could cost somewhere between twenty and $25,000. Really? That's not bad. Not bad at all. No, especially if you consider how much money you'd save on, you know, not having to pay someone to do all those things for you. And he threw out that number, what was it, like 10 billion? He, he said in excess of 10 billion units. 10 billion Optimus robots. That's more than the number of people on the planet. It's mind-boggling. It really is. But you know what it all points to, right? What's that? This whole age of abundance that Elon keeps talking about. Driven by AI and robotics, exactly. A world where technology makes everything cheaper, solves all our problems. It's exciting and also a little bit daunting, isn't it? It's like, 
What happens to the economy when you can have a robot do everything for you? Yeah, that's the billion dollar question, isn't it? It really is. But hey, on a more practical note, Elon made a good point about all this. What's that? He said, we got to be careful with information, especially online. Oh, absolutely. Now more than ever. With all the AI generated stuff out there. It's getting really hard to tell what's real and what's fake. E exactly. He even called out those deep fake videos of him promoting crypto scams. Yeah, those are getting out of control. And, you know, he basically said that if you see him promoting crypto online, it's not him. Probably a good rule of thumb for everyone, not just Elon. Totally. It's a good reminder for all of us to, like, think critically about what we're seeing online and be careful who and what we trust. Especially in a world where anyone can create content that looks and sounds incredibly real. Truth. But, you know, as much as Elon is realistic about the potential downsides of all this, he also remains such an optimist. Oh, for sure. He always does. He even said again that we're living in the most interesting time in history. And you know what? It's hard to disagree with him. I don't. Not one bit. We've got Starship pushing the boundaries of space travel. Optimus potentially changing the way we live and work. And full self-driving ab about to, like, completely transform how we get around. It's definitely an exciting time to be alive. That's for sure. It really makes you wonder what the world's going to look like in 5, 10, even 50 years, you know? Right. Like, if even half of this stuff comes true. Yeah. It's going to be a wild ride. That's one word for it. But hey, that's a question for another deep dive. For now, I think we've given our listeners plenty to think about. We have. We've explored some truly mind-blowing possibilities today and hopefully inspired our listeners to learn more about these incredible technologies shaping our future. Couldn't have said it better myself. So until next time, keep exploring, keep asking those big questions, and as always, keep diving deep. Ever scrolled past a photo and thought, you know what this needs? A rubber ducky mm -hmm. right there. And not just like a tiny one off in the corner, but like a huge E1, like stealing the show, trying to actually do that with like most editing tools. Nightmare. Well, get ready for some magic because today's deep dive is all about a paper that makes that rubber ducky dream shockingly real. It's called Click to Mask, Local Editing with Dynamic Mask Generation. And uh, these researchers from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem are about to rock your world. Oh, okay. okay, so before we get to the cool stuff, we've got to talk about the problem. Because you, dear listener, probably know how frustrating AI image editing can be sometimes. Frustrating is an understatement. I mean, yeah. some of these tools you're stuck, like, meticulously painting over every single pixel you want to change. Like, with right. Blended Diffusion, you've got this fixed mask, and you're kind of stuck with it. Ugh. I know exactly what you mean. You're basically stuck with whatever you masked, even if you change your mind later. And then there's the whole other category of tools that are all about the text prompts. Emu Edit Magic Brush, even Delhi 3, you tell them what to add, but good luck getting it exactly where you want it. This paper actually shows some pretty hilarious examples of these tools going totally rogue. Right, it's like they completely miss the memo on context. And then there are the segmentation-based tools, which are great for tweaking what's already there, but try adding something completely new, good luck with that. It's like they don't want you to have any real creative freedom. Exactly, and that's where Click2 Mask swoops in like a superhero. It promises to solve all those problems with this incredibly simple approach. You just click. So how on earth does it work? It all starts with that single click. Think of it like planting a seed for your edit. But here's where it gets really cool. Instead of being stuck with a static mask, Click2 Mask creates a dynamic mask. Imagine a time-lapse video of a flower blooming. But instead of a flower, it's your edit evolving based on the image A&D, your text prompt. Okay, this dynamic mask evolution thing sounds like the real game changer here. How does it actually work? What's going on behind the scenes? It's a powerful combination of two things. Blended, latent diffusion, or BLD, and something called alpha zeolite. Think of BLD as the engine that powers Click2 Mask's magic. It allows the AI to seamlessly blend your edits into the original image, almost like a super advanced Photoshop layer. So BLD is what makes the whole blending thing possible. Yeah. But how does it know what to blend? That's where alpha click comes in, right? Exactly. Alpha CLIP is like the brains of the operation. It acts as a kind of quality control, making sure the edit actually makes sense within the context of the image. So instead of just randomly slapping on your rubber ducky, the AI is actually trying to understand the image and make the edit look natural like it belongs there. That's amazing. So it's not just about adding stuff. It's about making it look realistic. It's like yeah. the AI is a professional photo editor making sure your edits blend in perfectly. Right. And the paper actually shows this whole mask evolution process, right? Yes. 
Figure two in the paper is incredible. They break down the entire process step by step so you can actually see the mask evolving from a single point to the final edit. That's so cool. And you know what else is cool? They've actually managed to improve upon BLD's ability to handle thin or small objects, which was a big limitation before. So think like a dog leash and a necklace, things that would tripped up older AI models. click to mask can handle them. Okay, so click to mask is clearly mind blowing on a technical level, but let's like zoom out a bit. What does this actually mean for like our listener? Why should they be excited about this beyond the wow factor? This is where it gets really exciting. Click to mask isn't just a cool new tool. It represents a huge leap forward in AI image editing. It has the potential to completely change who gets to be creative with images. Remember how we talked about like those clunky interfaces and limitations? Click to mask basically throws all that out the window. Yeah, it's like it's saying anybody can do this now, which is oh. pretty amazing. Exactly. Imagine designers effortlessly adding intricate patterns to their work or artists experimenting with like surreal concepts or even architects visualizing renovations on existing buildings. And all of this with just a few clicks and some carefully crafted prompts, the applications are mind-boggling. It's like giving everyone superpowers. Okay, you've convinced me this is huge, but let's be real. No technology is perfect. The paper does mention some limitations, right? That's right. Like with any cutting edge tech, there are always areas for improvement. For example, it sounds like Click2 masks can still stumble with extremely small or highly detailed masks. They use the example of trying to add a dog collar. Sometimes it works, sometimes it's a bit wonky. Did you find that to be the case? Yeah, those really fine details can still be a bit tricky for Click2 mask. And because of the way it uses stable diffusion to understand text prompts, placing objects accurately can be a challenge when similar objects are already nearby. For example, if you're trying to add Bigfoot next to a person, Click2 Mask might have a bit of trouble figuring out which one's which. Interesting. So even though the AI is getting better at understanding context, it still has its limits. But I guess that's to be expected with such a new technology, right? It's not like these limitations are a deal breaker or anything. Exactly. It's important to remember that this is just the beginning. These kinds of limitations are actually very common in AI image editing. They're not unique to Click2 Mask. The researchers are aware of these issues and actively working on solutions. And that constant evolution and refinement is what makes this field so dynamic. That's reassuring to hear. It's not about like reaching perfection overnight. It's about pushing the boundaries of what's possible. And Click to Mask is definitely doing that. Absolutely. It's like opening a door to a whole new world of creative possibilities. Okay, so we've covered a lot of ground here. Dynamic masks, AI powered editing, the good, the challenging. If our listener could walk away remembering just one thing from this whole deep dive, what would you want it to be? I think the biggest takeaway is this. Click2 Mask is a major step towards a future where AI image editing is intuitive, powerful, and accessible to everyone. It's like the difference between like using a clunky old compass and having a state-of-the-art GPS system. I love that analogy. Yeah. And while Click2 Mask might not be perfect yet, it's clear that it's paving the way for some incredible advancements in the field. Absolutely. And that actually leads to some really interesting questions about the future. We talked about how Click2 Mask can still struggle with those super fine details, but as AI gets better at understanding context, could we see a future where even those tiny elements, the dog collars, the stray hairs, become effortlessly editable with a click? Imagine the possibilities and the potential challenges. That is both incredibly exciting and a little bit daunting. It makes you wonder about the line between reality and digital creation and how that line might become even blurrier as this technology evolves. Exactly. It's a fascinating and rapidly changing landscape, and tools like Click2 Mask are just the beginning. Well, on that note, I think we've done our brains enough exercise for one day. Big thanks to you, as always, for breaking it all down with us. And to you, dear listener, happy editing. We'll catch you in the next deep dive. All right, buckle up, because today we're going deep on something pretty wild, something you've probably never even heard of. We're talking about Comar Charge. Comar Charge, right. It's like this, well, it's almost like a secret code. You could say that, yeah. And physicists are using it to unlock, like, some really mind-blowing stuff about black holes. Yeah, black holes are some of the most mysterious objects in the universe. Soul no mysteries, right. And Comar Charge gives us this way to kind of measure the energy and the momentum, all that packed into those things. Okay, so we're talking about measuring something we can't even see. Exactly, you can't see a black hole directly. Right, right. But with Comar Charge, we can get a sense of its properties. So it's like, hold on, let me see if I get this. Imagine like a hidden magnet. Okay, I like that. You can't see the magnetic field itself, obviously, but you can see how it affects things around it. Right, like 
iron filings, you can see them arranging themselves in a particular way. Exactly. So Comar charge is kind of like that, right? It helps us to map out that invisible force field. It's a way to make the invisible visible in a sense. That's interesting. So we're not just talking about black holes here, are we? This Comar charge thing, it applies to other stuff too, right? Absolutely. Anything that spins. Yeah. Anything with angular momentum. Angular momentum. Oh, yeah. Like a figure skater pulling their arms in to spin faster. Exactly. Same principle. So planets, stars, they've got it too. Absolutely. And black holes, they can spin incredibly fast. Wow. This is blowing my mind. It's pretty amazing stuff. So we're talking about this whole new way of understanding the universe, mm. like a new lens. That's a great way to put it. I mean, this Comar charge thing is helping us to measure stuff that, let's be honest, we never thought we'd be able to measure. It's true. It's pushing the boundaries of what we thought was possible. It's incredible. And yeah. the paper we're looking at today, it actually gives us some concrete examples. Like there's this one equation. I think it's equation 1.9. Ah, yes. Equation 1.9. Right. That one, it shows us how to actually calculate the mass of a black hole using Comar charge. It's a pretty remarkable equation. So we can actually put a number on it. We can, based on our understanding of Comar charge. Wow. That's incredible. So if we can figure out a black hole's Comar charge, we know its mass. Just like that. Well, it's a bit more complicated than that, but you've got the right idea. Okay. But still. And this equation, this takes into account the spinning we were talking about. The angular momentum. It does. That's the beauty of it. It factors in both the mass and the spin. Both of those are crucial for understanding how gravity works in these extreme environments. This is mind-blowing stuff. Yeah. And I have a feeling it can't always be this straightforward, can it? Yeah. Like, there's got to be some limits to what even Comar charge can do, right? You're absolutely right. There are all always going to be those edge cases, right? Right. And the paper does actually mention some of these situations, situations where this, you know, our nice, neat Comar charge idea, it gets a little fuzzy. Fuzzy how? Give me an example. Well, there's this thing, they call it non-trivial topology. And that sounds a little intimidating. Non-trivial topology. Okay, yeah, that's that's a mouthful. It is. So what are we talking about here? Like black holes with a bad case of the Mondays. Okay, I like that. You know, not so much a bad case of the Mondays, but more like black holes getting all twisted around, you know? Twisted how? Okay, so you know what a donut looks like, right? Of course, who doesn't? A donut's got that one hole, right? Pretty Our simple. Donut. Classic donut shape. Right, but now imagine taking that donut and like twisting it, knotting it up, you know, adding all these extra loops and bends. Okay, so we're not talking about your average donut shop donut here. We're getting into some seriously weird shapes. Exactly. And that's kind of what we're talking about with black holes and this non-trivial topology. These black holes, they can theoretically have these incredibly bizarre shapes far beyond your average donut. Okay, so black holes gone wild, basically. But how does that mess with Comar charge? It's like this. When the shape of something, or in this case, the shape of space-time itself, gets all wonky... That original Comar charge calculation, it doesn't quite cut it anymore. Hmm. So it's like trying to measure the coastline of England, right? Hmm. The closer you look, the more little inlets and bays you discover. That's a great analogy. The more you zoom in, the more complex it gets. Right. And your measurement keeps changing. Yeah. So how do you deal with that? How do you measure something that seems to keep changing depending on how you look at it? Well, physicists... They're clever folks, right? The best. They're always coming up with these really ingenious workarounds. And in this case, they've come up with something called, get ready for it, generalized Comar charge. Generalized. So they basically gave Comar charge an upgrade. You could say that. Okay, so what's this generalized version do? It's like taking that basic ruler you were using before and swapping it out for, I don't know, some kind of super high-tech 3D scanner. Okay, I'm liking the sound of this. Right. Something that can handle all those twists and turns, all those bizarre shapes. It gives us a much more precise and versatile tool. So now we can measure the energy of these super weird, twisty black holes. Yeah, it. Generalized Comar charge, it can handle pretty much whatever weirdness the universe throws at us. That's incredible. But we're talking about more than just black holes here. We're... You're way ahead of me. That's exactly right. This generalized version, it has some seriously far-reaching implications. The paper even hints that it could change the way we think about entire theories of gravity. Hold on. Theories of gravity. Are we talking about, like, going beyond Einstein here? We might be. You see, as incredible as Einstein's theory of general relativity has been. And it's pretty darn incredible. Oh, absolutely. It's revolutionized our understanding of the universe. But even Einstein's theory, it has its limitations. There are things it can't quite explain. Like what? 
Give me an example. Well, take the accelerating expansion of the universe, for instance, or dark matter, dark energy. These are some of the biggest mysteries in physics today. Big mysteries indeed. <laughs> so these modified theories of gravity, they're trying to fill in those gaps. And generalized Komar charge is somehow involved. Okay, so now you're really getting into it. These modified theories, they're pushing the boundaries of what we know about gravity. And generalized Komar charge, it could be the key to unlocking some of those mysteries. Wow. So we've gone from measuring the mass of a black hole to potentially rewriting the laws of physics. It's pretty mind-blowing, isn't it? And that's what I love about this paper. It shows just how interconnected everything is in physics. So how does this all connect then? What's the link between Komar charge and these modified theories? Well, generalized Komar charge, it gives us this really powerful tool to test these new theories. Yeah. We can use it to make predictions about how gravity should behave in these modified models and then see if those predictions match up with what we actually observe. So it's like we have this theoretical tool and now we're finally getting to put it to the test. Exactly. And the paper actually delves into some specific examples of these modified theories just to give you a taste of what's possible. Oh, really? Like what? They talk about something called Einstein's scalar theory. Einstein's scalar <laughs> theory. Okay, and what's that all about? That one, it's a whole other can of worms, my friend. Bring on the worms. So we're talking about, what, a whole new way of looking at gravity. Think of it like opening up this whole new toolbox with a bunch of shiny new tools to explore the universe with. It's an exciting time to be a physicist, that's for sure. My mind is officially blown. Yeah. We've gone from black holes to modified theories of gravity all in one deep dive. Yeah. This generalized Komar charge, it seems like it has the potential to be a real game changer in physics. It really does. And it all comes back to this idea that even though we can't see everything in the universe directly, we can still find ways to measure it, to understand it. It makes me wonder what other possibilities are out there. What other mysteries are waiting to be uncovered? So just to recap for a second, we've gone from using this thing called Komar charge to like size up black holes, figure out their mass and all that. Right. And now we're talking about how it might actually help us unlock entirely new theories of gravity. It's a pretty wild ride. Total mind blowing. Like we've mm. been given this new, super powerful, I don't know, like a lens almost. Yeah, a new way of seeing things. And now we can peek into these parts of the universe we didn't even know existed before. Parts of the universe where the rules of gravity, they might be totally different from what we're used to. Exactly. And the more we explore these like weird, warped corners of the universe. The more we realize we don't know. Exactly. Like it just keeps getting more and more mysterious. That's the beauty of it. There's it's... always something new to discover. I know. I'm thinking back to those modified theories of gravity we were talking about. Right, right. Like that Einstein scalar theory, that was a whole other. <laughs> That's a whole other deep dive right there. Yeah. I know, right? We could spend a whole nother episode on that one. But it's just like this little taste of what's out there. It makes you wonder what else is out there, what other possibilities we haven't even dreamt of yet. Right. What other secrets gravity is hiding. And that's what I find so exciting about physics. Every answer, it just leads to more questions. So true. It's like this never-ending journey of discovery. Exactly. And we're all just along for the ride. This whole deep dive, it's been amazing. We started with some pretty basic definitions. No, come or who? Right. And now, I mean, we're talking about the very edge of what we know about gravity and the universe and everything. The universe is a pretty amazing place when you really think about it. It really is. And it's incredible to think about these physicists, these brilliant minds. Yeah, pushing the boundaries of human knowledge. Using tools like Komar, charge, to challenge everything we thought we knew. <sighs> it's humbling, isn't it? It really is. It makes you feel, I don't know, Kind of small, but also kind of inspired at the same time. Like, if they can unlock these secrets of the universe, what else is possible, you know? Absolutely. The universe is full of mysteries, just waiting for us to uncover them. That's a great note to end on. Thanks for taking this deep dive with me. Anytime. Always a pleasure to talk physics.